Good morning and a very warm welcome to the third meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee. Last week, as a result of Mr Harvey's new ministerial role, he has stepped down from the committee and I'd like to thank Mr Harvey for his contribution during his time, albeit brief. Um, but um, his place has now been taken by Mark Russell, who we welcome to the committee this morning. We look forward to working with you and I'd like to invite you to uh, declare any relevant interest. Thanks very much, Kavina. Um, looking forward to the, the work ahead and nothing to declare. Thank you very much. Agenda item one is decision taking uh, on business in private and members invited to decide to consider the work programme in private at, at following today's public meeting. Indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, and agenda item two is um, a BBC annual report and accounts agenda item. We'll be taking evidence from Steve Carson, director of the BBC Scotland, Lee Tavazia, chief operating officer at the BBC and the BBC's annual report and accounts agenda. I welcome you both to the meeting this morning and invite you to make Mr Carson to make a brief opening statement. Thank you and good morning uh, convener and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to return to give evidence at the Scottish Parliament to this new committee with culture within its remit. I'm sorry that once again we're speaking via video rather than meeting in person but I'm pleased that joining me Today, also from Pacific Key in Glasgow, is the BBC's Group Chief Operating Officer, Lee Tabatseva. The period covered by the annual report and accounts saw the BBC as a public broadcaster find itself at the heart of a global pandemic, not just in terms of how we served audiences in Scotland, but how we also continue to operate, ensure that our teams were safe in delivering critical public services at an unprecedented time. Like other industries in Scotland, the broadcasting sector has continued to adapt and change at speed. In BBC Scotland, we produced daily educational content on TV while schools were closed. We increased our news coverage, televised religious services while places of worship were shut, and we commissioned lockdown-specific content from the sector, including working in partnership with the National Theatre of Scotland and Screen Scotland. The ongoing shadow of COVID impacted greatly on broadcast production in the year covered by the accounts. Many productions planned for filming last year have only recently restarted Swashbuckle, a major children's series, had to stop production in March 2020. And I'm delighted to say it's now back in studio. Two series of Shetland are now shooting back to back this year to make up for delays last year. The impact of not being able to film regular and planned content for a number of months is clearly seen in the accounts, with the drop in network spend below the level set for us as a target for Scotland. We expect this to be a one-off impact in the year of COVID, with spend returning to meet or exceed its target in the current year and beyond. That snapshot of what was paused from March 2020 onwards, in a way, serves to illustrate the momentum that has been building for the screen industry in Scotland in recent years. Since launch, the BBC Scotland channel has established itself as the largest digital channel in Scotland, ahead of many household names. It has just been nominated as Channel of the Year at this year's Broadcast Digital Awards, and BBC Scotland content has picked up several significant industry awards over the past year. These nominations and awards are a reminder of the important role the BBC plays in building and growing the screen sector here. In 2017, we appeared at this parliament to give details of the biggest single investment in broadcast content in 20 years, a move which created the channel, increased investment in news and current affairs, and uplifts in network TV programming. This year, our Across the UK strategy commits the BBC to spending an additional £700 million, both on screen and radio outside London. We know we have a role to play here, and our partnership with Screen Scotland has been instrumental in growing the creative sector. Partnership is also at the heart of our Gaelic services too, and we are delighted that alongside MG Alaba, we'll soon be launching Speak Gaelic, a multi-platform language learning course with programming across BBC Alaba, Radio and Gael, and other services. I would say that despite finally the profound challenges of the past months, it is once again a moment of hope for the sector as we start to emerge from the pandemic. Lee and I look forward to discussing the annual report, points and associated matters throughout this morning's session. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Carson. Um, if I could maybe, um, just before we move to, to questions from the committee, and if they could please, if they're able to, direct the questions either to Mr. Carson or to Ms. Tavaziva, that would be very helpful. Um, if I could just ask a general question, you, you rightly mentioned the launch of the new channel, um, and I wondered if you could comment just on um, 
some of the, whether you feel that it's, it's met its initial objectives that were set for that. Um, if we go back to April 2018, Ofcom had raised concerns, particularly about perhaps a lack of um, new programmes and uh, the removing the potential for opportunities for independent producers. And I know that that was raised. And it just, just would you, if you reflect on, on that objective and the other objectives of the channel and how successful you think that's been. Well, I think the uh, I think not just our view, but the, sort of the view of the wider creative sector was that the channel has been a success uh, in, in audience performance terms. Um, as I mentioned at the opening remarks, it's from a standing start two years ago established itself as the largest digital uh, channel in Scotland, uh, well ahead of other of other household names that, uh, that that have been established for a considerable time. Uh, the, the Scotland Channel, in the year shown in the accounts, uh, grew its reach. That's the amount of people tuning in every week to 21%. So that's that's you know more than one in five Scots watching the Scotland Channel uh, every week. Uh, the average time spent for those viewers was was one and a half hours a week. So uh, to put it in context, the uh, digital channels. Typically, a, a successful digital channel would be doing about a 1% one, uh, 1 share of viewing. Many household names, again, less than that. Uh, the Scotland Channel, BBC Scotland Channel, uh, has achieved 2.5% uh, share of viewing. Uh, the terrestrial channels, BBC One to Channel 5, the top five, uh, they're often considerably in excess of digital channels. Uh, our reach is, is not, far behind, not far behind Channel 5. On regular evenings, in fact, you'll find the BBC Scotland Channel has had more viewers uh, across the evening than... Uh, Channel 5, Channel 4, or, or, or even BBC 2. In terms of the creative sector, the channel, the investment channel, has meant we've worked with uh, more than 80 production companies, uh, many of them uh, new to the industry as well. And we've also worked uh, to bring in other investment with other parts of the BBC, with Screen Scotland, uh, and others who played a really big and important part of the sector here. Um, in terms of the industry response, I think possibly the clearest example I could give you was that at the Royal Television Society Scotland Awards last year, a special jury prize was awarded to the BBC Scotland Channel. The Royal Television Society Scotland is obviously made up of members of the industry here in Scotland. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, go to move to questions from the committee. I'm going to bring in uh, Dr Allen, please. Thank you very much, um, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm not sure. I think my, my question might be for uh, Ms uh, Tavasiva or, or perhaps... Um, uh, Steve Carson as well. Um, it's really just to, to to get your views about this this issue that there's long running question that there's always been about the spend that there is in Scotland, and, and to say really I think that that we'll all welcome the fact that there is uh, more spend on on big network productions that in, involve Scotland. But just really to tease out, is that not a different? Are these two slightly different things we're talking about here? There's the part Scotland plays in big network wide productions and the discretion that the BBC in Scotland has to actually spend its money on the things that it thinks are important to it rather than to be, to be brought into something else. So I just wonder if you could tease out those differences and say where we're going with the latter. The, by the yeah, latter, I mean you, local spend. Sorry. Thank you, Dr Allen, um, for your question and thank you for having me today. I think I um, absolutely focus more broadly on, on the group, and you're right, about the choices and the decisions we make around where we spend and invest the licence fee payers' money on the productions and TV that we make and radio that um, audience members listen to as well. We have a very clear strategy at the group, which we announced earlier this year, absolutely continue to shift more money and power and decision-making outside of London, across the UK, into our nations, and, and across the UK English, uh, English regions as well. That's critically important. We will be moving £700 million of additional spend outside of London over the next five years, and that will include an economic benefit to the UK of approximately £850 million. We are shifting um, to, uh, TV and video programme making to 60% made outside of London, and video and audio um, as well, up to 50%. So these are significant changes. We're also moving people across the UK. We continue to support having the majority of our employees in the public service working outside of London. We'll continue to work towards that as well, um, including, of course, ensuring that the money we spend is well invested and thoughtfully invested. I'm, I'm sure Steve would like to comment more specifically on Scotland and some of the choices we're making there as well. 
Yes, thank you. Um, um, as you point out, then, so the BBC overall spend in, in Scotland is a mixture of what we call network spend on, on our network channels and uh, stations and services, and then um, spend which is directly controlled by BBC Scotland, uh, which we uh, we use to pr provide our own services, uh, special programming, including news, obviously, on BBC One Scotland, Scotland Channel, uh, our contributions to iPlayer and our digital services. Radio Scotland and, and Radio Nangale, and then in partnership with MG Alba, uh, the BBC, uh, BBC Alba channel. Um, what has been a, a part of the strategy that uh, that Scotland, I think, has been, it's fair to say, at the, at the lead in, is increasing the amount of co-commissioning then between different parts of the BBC, as potentially with other nations like Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, or with those network services. And we we've seen as a as a matter of strategy, and it will be a very important part of delivering across the UK strategy. A sharp uptick in, in co-commissions uh, between ourselves and network services. To, to give you some examples, for example, uh, Guilt, uh, the uh, BBC Scotland channel's launched drama, uh, was co-produced with funding from in Scotland uh, and also BBC Two. I'm delighted that Guilt Series Two, which was also delayed by COVID, is to return to our screens this autumn. That's, that's a co-commission co-production. Um, Murder Case, Murder Trial, and some other uh, big premium uh, factual titles, and enables us to kind of use the resources we have tap into other investment to create things of scale and impact for audiences in Scotland. And then, of course, through iPlayer, audiences in other nations in the UK can access the, that programming too. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned some of the economic um, benefit there to, to disperse and work. But I, I suppose I'm interested in the, the last point you're making there um, about the, if you like, the, the cultural benefit of this and uh, you know, for instance, one of, one of the, the long-running questions has always been about, about broadcasting in Scotland is about what can be done to commission more drama in Scotland. Uh, I do seem to remember a rumour um, when uh, BBC Scotland, the new channel, was established that we were going to get uh, a dramatisation of Sir Walter Scott's Waverley. I live in hope of that. But um, I, I wonder what you can say about new writing and also a focus on, on drama. I mean, everyone looks back to things like Tutti Frutti as, as great examples um, of, of both new writing and drama. Um, is, is the BBC in Scotland, does it have the discretion to actually produce something like that now? Yeah, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, I, I do think that um, um, our momentum is building and has built in the creative sector in Scotland uh, over, over the past number of years. Um, in terms of, of uh, our ability to support new writing and drama, um, you know, I very much see BBC Scotland as, as uh, in partnership with others, as part of a, with a series of pipelines to nurture and bring through talent. We have our own discrete digital spaces and channels. We've got, for example, uh, in comedy, short comedy development, uh, short stuff on Facebook. We've got the social, which is targeted at bringing in new talent and young people. We're also then through pan BBC initiatives like the Writers' Room, uh, able to uh, support development of, of new, new drama, uh, scripted comedy, uh, scripted um, writing. To give you one current example, we have on iPlayer, um, again co-funded with Screen Scotland, um, a, a short series called Float, uh, which again came from an initiative through the BBC's Writer Room. Uh, I think Steph Smith, the writer, is her, is her first uh, broadcast piece. Um, so we very much see ourselves as the ability to kind of try new things, experiment, bring things either through our digital services onto something like the BBC Scotland Channel, which is a, a very strong arena to experiment and innovate. And then again, through the rest of the pipeline, through co-commissioning to network services and beyond, you know, beyond Scotland and, and beyond the UK. Um, the drama slate coming through, again, partly entered by COVID, you can see, I mentioned Guilt Series 2 now coming back. We can see in there this week, Vigil, uh, network drama. Currently shooting in Scotland is Control Room, another drama coming through. Um, the comedy slates, I'm delighted to see this week on Monday, BBC One Scotland. Guts, uh, which again came out of an initiative we ran last year to pilot new sitcoms, and we went to the Went to series with the Scots, which again was delayed, but is now on air. So I do think if you if you look forward six months, you will have seen the work done really over the past three years in developing that pipeline coming through. Now, I, I take your point about the wa Waverley, um, <laughs> um, and uh, but we'll we'll look at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank We're you. Very, I, I, the, the Scotland the Scotland Channel is very much focused on on modern Scotland, but you know there is room on BBC Scotland to cover our whole range of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I begin, Ms. Weber? Thanks. Thank you very much, convener. Yes, I suppose I want to ask some questions, it's probably of yourself, Mr. Carson. I'm not entirely sh sure. More digging into the value for money and in relation to uh, BBC Scotland Channel. 
Um, firstly, I suppose you say it's the largest, but what are you using to define the largest? So we have three main metrics when we're looking at uh, performance of services. Um, share, which is uh, the share of audience watching uh, on, on broadcast hours aggregated across a year. So uh, BBC Scotland's share of viewing uh, is now 2.5%. As I mentioned to you, other digital channels, um, I can probably talk about BBC portfolio channels, so BBC News, BBC Four, would have shares of sort of 1% or so. Other channels like with the BBC would uh, would have um, would have shares between 1% and 2%. Uh, so 2.5% makes us, by audience share, the biggest channel in Scotland in year to date. The other thing we measure then is reach, so the amount of people tuning in to a service or, or listening in across a week or a month. Uh, and the annual report and account shows that our reach for the BBC Scotland channel, which is just one of our services, we have BBC One Scotland, we, we, we have other services, BBC Alibaba as well, just within TV and iPlayer, that's 21%. So by reach and share, it is the largest digital channel in Scotland. The reach figure then is, you look at Channel 5, we're not we're not allowed to discuss other other channels' performance, but th those, that, that reach figure is, is close to a terrestrial, which is very unusual for a digital channel. Okay, thanks. And you said 2.5, but in terms of actual uh, viewers, uh, what is that in a number? Sorry, um... it can it can it can it can depend on the program at hand. So uh, we we can get audiences uh, of 100,000 plus on, on the channel. We can get we can get smaller audiences, and that that's partly what it's designed for. Uh, you. When we look at audience value, we're not necessarily always talking about as a publicly funded broadcaster mass audiences. You can have smaller audiences that highly value the content, um, and I think we find that on on channel content and on our other services such as BBC Alba as well. Bear in mind, of course, that the channel viewing figures are only one part of the consumption. Uh, the channel also has its own dedicated space on BBC iPlayer, and what we've seen since launch in 2019 is that request to view. BBC Scotland commissioned content on iPlayer has uh, more than doubled. I think the, the year we're looking at here is 70 million requests to view of that content on iPlayer, um, significantly in Scotland, but also in other nations of the UK as well. OK, 70 million, but that's not 70 million people. That's just, it could be the same number, small number of people accessing, sorry, accessing multiples. I'm well, trying to get down to... 70 million would be a significant amount of people. I don't think it's one person watching 70 million. No, no, of course not. Time. We're being a bit... Uh, ridiculous now, but I'm just trying to get a sense of good value for money and what is the cost yeah. per viewer of that £34 million pounds that we're investing in that in that digital platform, that's all. Well, of course, you know, if you look at the overall investment the BBC makes in Scotland, that's that's part of it. Uh, I think it's important, um, as I was talking about serving audiences, but also growing the sector, that we have a dedicated service on TV and iPlayer for Scotland. It's a complementary service to the rest of the BBC portfolio, including you know, I mentioned the Scots this week, that's Premier and BBC One Scotland, with very important news programmes reporting Scotland on, on BBC One Scotland. So it's part of the overall mix. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say, and the industry view would be that from launch to, to get to where the channel established itself as the largest digital service in Scotland has, has been a real achievement for the creative sector in Scotland. I mean, the investment announced was a challenge. Could the creative sector in Scotland, Scotland rise to making a whole host, a significant volume of new programming, a whole host of genres? from comedy, drama to, to documentary. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that challenge has been met. It's a real tribute to the sector in Scotland. And so finally, convener, if that's okay, just so you're saying your digital viewing is at 2.5% and it is higher than other digital channels, but what's your ambition? What are you, what are you trying to go out and, and achieve over the next uh, three, five, and maybe 10 years? I think, I think the, the, the ambition is creative. Uh, you know, we want to help establish and grow the sector in Scotland to make great programmes um, for audiences in Scotland and then through iPlayer distribution and co-commissions with network services across the UK. When that, that's simply put, you know, we're, we're broad, public broadcasters, we're here to serve audiences. The way to do that is to work with our own teams in BBC Scotland and elsewhere, the wider creative sector working, as I say, with more than 80 suppliers now to make great content. You want to make sure enough people are watching it, but as I say, some programmes might not have high audiences, but if they're very highly valued, that's also important. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to questions from Ms Boyack. Ms Boyack is joining the committee remotely this morning. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm going to ask two questions, one of each witness, if that's possible. Um, the first one is just to follow up on the issue of 
uh, commissioning of programmes in Scotland. Um, you've talked a bit about rebooting um, coming through the pandemic. Can you give us um, the numbers on, uh, you've got different types of new projects, drama, comedy and factual content. Can you give us a sense of how you are retaining and increasing employment opportunities, not just for actors, but for all the staff involved in um, making new content? Yes, well, I think I'll take I'll take that one first. Um, so, as I say, production for a number of planned pieces was paused last year. We're now seeing um, there was a, um, a requirement for scripted productions, comedy and drama, that we needed an insurance underwriting position to allow that to happen. That that's now gone through. So, we're seeing the return of uh, of, of production in, in those sectors, uh, specifically during the the when the pandemic hit. Um, BBC Scotland and the rest of the BBC had a number of measures to support the wider, um, the wider uh, community, the wider creative sector, and and and, this, and the the, the craft, craft uh, skills you cite. Um, the small indie fund, which is operated by the BBC, it, it more than doubled, and eighteen Scottish indies were supported through that, uh, directly through Scotland commissioning. We put a number of COVID-specific uh, productions up and running. To serve audiences again, a desire uh, they, they remain in the sort of factual and entertainment area. Uh, one of them, Susan Kalman's um, self isolation, um, um, was to get checks to writers, artists, performers specifically mm -hmm. uh, on, on that. Um, I mean, there was a number of sector supports from Screen Scotland. They put a freelance bursary stream in, came in very early. Um, but essentially, the best support we can give is to help work with people to get productions back safely. Again, I would pay tribute to our own teams in Scott, BBC Scotland and other independent producers for working out ways to get productions back safely. W one example I give you is Scotland's Home of the Year, a very successful title which came through uh, the BBC Scotland channel made by IWC. They managed to work out production protocols so that that could be made last year. Um, I would pay tribute to, to, to everyone working through ways to do it safely. Um, more broadly, then we support we support the BBC's Writers Room. We've got our own talent development initiatives. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned Bloat. Again, iPlayer is a chance to try things out. Uh, BBC Scotland Channel is a chance to try things out that, that could grow grow further. And is there scope for increasing that over the years to come in terms of new productions in Scotland? Yeah, well, as I say, the direction of travel, the BBC strategy is clear across the UK. We'll move more decision making and more spend in content outside London, and you know uh, you can see the direction of travel. COVID accepting in Scotland over a number of years. Um, uh, the co-commissioning initiative I mentioned, you know, that's across uh, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. We're looking at £25 million worth of business being co-commissioned. Um, and as I say, BBC Scotland, I think, has sort of uh, been, been, been trialling how to do that, which brings, from, from the Scotland point of view, it brings more investment from other parts of the BBC into Scotland to, to create this, this content. Yeah, it would be dead useful to just get a sense of actual job numbers as well, maybe afterwards, um, if you could write to us, that would be useful. Um, can I ask a, a different question um, to Ms Tabasiva about um, what you're doing in terms of addressing the challenges uh, between different types of um, broadcasting, particularly the, the role, important role of public sector broadcasting, given the private online streaming services have really rocketed during the pandemic, and what consideration you're giving to um, the accessibility and different ways of accessing um, BBC products, thinking of young people, older people, in terms of costs um, of accessing through connectivity and broadband. Wondering what's been done on that at that a UK BBC level. Yeah. No, thank you. And of course, the BBC has, is absolutely clear on its public responsibilities for universality and actually that we can bring a range of our services across watching, listening, and of course, our news programmes too, to all audiences across the UK, and that's critically important to us. Just come back again to across the UK and the focus on portrayal. So not only do we move money and power and decision making out, outside of London, but actually how we portray the communities um, across the UK, local communities, and the BBC as a public, large public service broadcaster in the UK has, a, has an ability to do that that none of the global media organizations can do. So we have colleagues across the organization, across the UK, United Kingdom, um, in local communities, telling local stories. And we, we need to do more of that, more representation of that across all of our programming and, and across our storytelling as well. And that's what makes the BBC unique. 
it can be distinctive and different and tell these these local stories and that's absolutely in line with our strategy and what we fundamentally believe our audiences want they want from us as a public service broadcaster putting audiences at the heart of everything we do and really understanding those needs absolutely therefore needs to drive the decision making and the choices we make and where we therefore invest our money to be, to be able to deliver on those needs. So, so what impact um, has it made in terms of the shift in terms of your future role with people opting out and, and going on to online streaming for example um, that is private sector companies how is that impacting on the BBC going forward because mm -hmm. it's hugely important in terms of that accessibility and you know I've particularly mentioned younger people's different viewing habits and maybe older people as well not to get into the detail of the, the license fee but those are kind of important issues in terms of cost and accessibility. I'll, I'll use two examples particularly focusing on on our younger audiences so 16 to 34 years old um, we have seen over the last year, over the last years, if we're comparing the year before to the year of 20, 2021, despite the pandemic, we've absolutely seen a shift in our younger audience, audiences moving from linear television into our digital channels. And actually the growth in iPlayer for those younger audiences more than offset the loss to some of our linear TV watching for those younger audiences. But we also accept, um, and your point is right about accessibility, we do have a digital divide in the UK, we do have audiences who are not able to access those streaming services in the way that many others can. And a, and a good example of our strategy to focus on that is taking BBC Three back into the linear channel. So we recognize the huge success and popularity of BBC Three. We moved it very early on into an online channel, but we also feel strongly that taking it back onto linear television enables those who do not aren't able to access the kind of streaming and down and download um, requirements for, on broadband on on their mobiles or on any device that they're watching. So that bringing that back onto linear television is a, an important example of how we are absolutely are addressing that digital divide and ensuring that we can um, continue to deliver universal universally across the UK for all our audiences. Yeah, thanks. I think that access to digital connections is absolutely crucial for people in low incomes and also for older people. You don't maybe have the, the access to that. So I think really important that that's something that's prioritised going forward. Thanks, convener. Thank you very much. Um, can I bring in Miss Mintel, please? Thank you, convener. And um, it's great to welcome you both to the committee. I just want to make a voluntary declaration that uh, I worked for BBC Scotland um, leaving uh, 11 years ago. Um, Steve, can I, you, you commented uh, on the reduction uh, on spend in BBC Scotland on production last year due to COVID. Um, and, but I understand, if I've read the figures correctly, that the actual hours still hit the target. So I'm interested to know what the, the mix of commissioning, does that mean that there was cheaper programmes um, commissioned from Scotland? And you also note um, in your report that the BBC has committed, and you've said as well uh, that you are committed to exceed network spend targets in future years. And so I'm interested um, if you can give us an indication of what the programming types are and what the timescales for that. And you've both also mentioned on a number of occasions the, the plan to move commissioners um, out, out perhaps of the London metropolitan area. Again, I'd like to know the timescale for that, if possible, please. Okay, I think I'll take your, your middle piece first. So, um, the projections we're making this year is that the BBC as a whole will will meet will meet or exceed the the network uh, spend target for Scotland. You know, we, we can't be completely certain because we can't be certain about what's going to happen with the pandemic that we're still experiencing. So, the commitment is to meet the target. We we believe we'll meet or or exceed uh, this year and then going forward. And if you look at the years pre pre COVID, you could see an an, an increase. Uh, coming through there. Um, in terms of commissioning power, um, that has been actively worked through the Across the UK strategy, uh, BBC Content, which is a sort of the network, as you, as you know, Network TV, and now Radio Division, uh, we're, uh, we're in close conversations with them about increasing the amount of network commissioners that we already have based in, in Scotland. We, we have a number. The co-commissioning piece I talked about is a way also then of, of increasing commissioning decision making without Adding um, adding extra posts, so we have a team of very talented 
commissioners in Scotland. Be co-commissioning them. They're making creative decisions there that will impact on our own services and across the BBC. Um, in terms of the drop in um, what we call BBC Scotland spend the last year, COVID played a very, very significant part in that. Uh, there were also some savings which across the BBC were made uh, as well, but, but COVID was the key factor there. I, I think you're right, you've noted that despite that, the number of hours we delivered actually increased slightly. Um, and that is, as you say, you know, there were some, um, some genres that we could not maintain in production. Um, the Scots, the comedy, for example, would, would have been one of them. That just wasn't possible to film last year, but, but I'm delighted to say it's back now. What we did then, um, and I pay tribute to the production teams uh, involved, is expand a whole range of, of other services. So, for example, things we had not done before in religion. Uh, we, on some, as, as you know, mosques, churches, temples closed. You know, we just had quickly identified, and I think the great thing was we've done quickly, that sort of spiritual need. So we put reflections from the key on really quickly. We, for the first time, just live broadcast the service, again, on the BBC Scotland channel. Then, in terms of uh, education, and this goes back, I think, to, uh, to the digital divide. The school shot in Scotland, as, as you know, very quickly. Within a week, we were on air uh, with the Bite Size Scotland on TV, uh, addressing that need, knowing that not every child in Scotland uh, has access to a laptop or broadband. So be aware linear TV is part of that. We then, of course, have expanded news provisions, briefings, etc. So uh, if you look at the figures in the annual report, you'll see some genres like drama, comedy, entertainment, music and arts. The numbers have gone down, purely COVID-driven, uh, uh, but, other, but other genres were expanded. I, I don't, and I think we learned some useful lessons for the future there. I think the religion I put, um, there, was a, there was a very very strong public demand for that. And I think that complements what we do on, on Radio Scotland, and of course, in religious programming. Yeah, um, just as an anecdote, um, I, I have friends and actually my mother was very appreciative of the religious output that the, the channel provided during lockdown. Um, I'm interested, you, you touched on a bit about what you learnt through the pandemic as well, um, perhaps in production ways, the, the quicker commissioning. Um, I, so I'd be interested in a bit, a bit more expansion with regards to that, but also um, the BBC Alaba channel started um, what, about 10, 12 years ago, and it's actually it's longer than that, I think. Um, you, um, you've, you've mentioned them a number of times in co-productions. Um, I'm in, interested to look at the different ways that BBC Alaba uh, commissions. So they commission PASCAN agreements or um, bundles of programmes from um, producers. Um, and then followed by top-up commissioning rounds. And so that kind of allows an element of economies of scale for both the um, broadcaster, but also the, the programme producers as well, and allows them to plan their output. Um, and I, you could argue reduces risk um, on both producer and mm -hmm. broadcaster. So I'd be interested to know um, your thoughts on that um, model, perhaps for the BBC Scotland channel, but perhaps even wider across BBC Scotland. Yes, well, I think you're, you're right to point out. I mean, BBC Alba Channel has been uh, it's an extraordinary achievement uh, led by our partners in NG Alba and, and our own BBC Scotland team led by my Margaret Mary Murray. You're right, they have a slightly different commissioning model and they tend to do sort of larger uh, output deals with a smaller number of companies. Uh, and I think that's a very important part of, of, again, developing what was a small Gaelic speaking creative sector at that time. Um, we work, obviously, BBC Alba is a, is, a, is a service within a portfolio done in partnership. Um, one of the things we've done over the past number of years in BBC Scotland is really to integrate our services and radio, TV, online, social. So there's very close connections uh, uh, in a way that I don't think was there before between BBC Alba as a service uh, and our other, our, our other services. And we've seen through uh, co-commissioning and co-productions significant increases uh, in pieces that can run on either an or service. There's, uh, for example, this weekend in the Transmit Festival that was traditionally, you know, through our English language services. That's now also appearing on on BBC Alba uh, uh, for for Gaelic speakers too. Uh, we've increased, I think, by more than 50% children's production on BBC Alba. Increased uh, news provision at the weekends there. I think 25 hours a year. So I, I think it is a mixed ecology. I think output deals do do have their place, and as you say, do provide um, sort of underpinning for some parts of the sector. I, I think. Through, through our other services, it is good to work with a plurality of suppliers. We talked about 80 suppliers that we work with. Uh, you know, you want the best ideas for the audiences, uh, first and foremost. Um, and I say, I do think that we've managed to find a model with partners like Screen Scotland, who've been incredibly successful in agency for Scotland since day 
that began a few years ago. I do think we find a model that people are, are, are working well with, bringing a significant amount of, of co-production funding. You know, since, since the year of channel launch, I think we looked at some figures recently, but £10 million of licence fare payer BBC Scotland investment has leveraged £14 million of investment from other sources. So £10 million from BBC Scotland creates a £24 million pot for content. And that's been a very successful model, I think. May I just ask one quick final question? Yes. Um, yes just shifting uh, to the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, and I'm interested to know if um, the performances have been impacted at all by the in inability, perhaps, to get performers over from Europe. I appreciate clearly with COVID um, the situation that there won't be many live performances, but if, if there's been any impact or it, what you're doing for the future to perhaps um, uh, alleviate any issues there. Yes, well, I'm glad you glad you, you 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 pointed that out. So the Scottish BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra obviously was, was unable to perform for audiences over the, the worst of the lockdowns, but uh, I'm delighted to say they're back now performing. Um, there have been uh, I was just looking at some requests uh, this week. We very care there have been requests to bring people in to do that. We obviously they work very carefully through the uh, the protocols on that. Uh, so um, it, it's it's proved more complex through COVID, but we've actually found ways to work within. Uh, Scottish government uh, regulations to, to to do that. So uh, uh, the 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 SSO are now performing again at a very successful run at the proms, and I think later on this month as well. So again, that's that's uh, you know, it's such an important part of what uh, the BBC is here for in Scotland, and uh, they again find ways to to uh, to keep performing remotely through the worst of through the worst of lockdown. But I know they're all delighted to be back having an audience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can bring in Mr. Connor. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I've got a <clears throat> question about um, the future and, and public service broadcasting in, in general, um, because Ofcom, of course, produced a report this year that said that public service broadcasting faces considerable challenges and threats, and that's been exacerbated by COVID. Um, in particular around rapidly changing uh, consum consumption patterns, rapidly changing markets uh, and competition, especially internationally. And they made several recommendations uh, to the UK government uh, around modernization. Uh, I'd just be interested to hear from a, a BBC Scotland perspective, do you agree with Ofcom's uh, diagnosis? Um, and um, what observations do you have to, to make on, on the kind of um, the cure, as it were? Well, I, I think I'll, I, I'll, I'll leave from a BBC Scotland perspective, but I'm sure Lee would be able to give sort of you know, the, overall, the overall picture as well. Um, I mean, I, I, I think Ofcom quite rightly points out, and it's sort of, it would be evident that competition uh, for, for what we call screen time, that's from, from everything from gaming to people watching subscription video on demand, like Netflix and Amazon Prime, that's only going one way. There's going to be more and more competition. Um, you know, the, I think the, the way to address that, frankly, is to make really good programming um, on all services that appeal to audiences and, and all audiences. I think one of the key things about being licensed fee funded is a near universal fee it means that you have to provide something for everyone. But in, in the in the BBC model, all audiences of equal value. Now, commercial broadcasters, subscription um, subscription broadcasters. They can't say that. Frankly, some audiences are more commercially valuable than others. So I think the BBC's um, licensee fund agreement means that we then do really look hard at serving, from our point of view, all audiences in Scotland. And you know, despite the competition in, in the market, I think Ofcom's also pointed out, you know, traditional, uh, so-called traditional broadcasting, still a very important part of the market. BBC iPlayer, if you look at streamers, Netflix, Amazon, BBC iPlayer itself is a very successful large uh, Scottish and, and UK streaming service. Um, that's really its future, I think, will be increasingly protected by uh, it's a te technical rights issues. But if you recall, we used to, under the rights agreement, delete uh, iPlayer content after 30 days. You can now keep it up for a year or longer. Uh, you know, that's already made a huge, a huge contribution to iPlayer viewing. Linear TV then is, is still still very important. Uh, the, uh, the Media Nations report that Ofcom did for Scotland showed in, uh, was published in August, I think showed that People in Scotland watch um, three hours, 39 minutes of broadcast TV every day, and, and young audiences also consume um, BBC content in, in large numbers, including in Scotland. Our, our reach for 
16 to 34 is across the BBC is still 80 percent per week. So there's more competition in the market. The license fee model of funding, I think, does promote universality, does make us think hard all the time about all audiences. I worked for semi-commercial broadcasters in the past, and as I say, frankly, some audiences were more commercially valuable. And it's one of the wonderful things about working at the BBC that we we do believe all audiences have equal value. And I don't really, I think. I don't know if yeah, thank you, Steve. I would j just to, to add a group perspective um, to Steve's um, excellent comments there. You know, we re absolutely recognise the challenging competitive environment that the BBC now finds itself in, competing against global media organisations who have much deeper pockets, far more money to invest than we have, and are considerably doing so. I think that the BBC's strategy and our strategic priorities are absolutely clearly set with that in mind, reforming the BBC to enable us to tackle and, and optimise ourselves against that really challenging environment. You know, we have set clear guidelines around impartiality. That makes us different and it stands out and it's what you'd expect from a large public service broadcaster in the UK, investing in great content, particularly that's distinctive and tells the stories, the local stories across the United Kingdom, building our digital services. Steve talked about iPlayer there, doing incredibly well in its own right against these large technology media corporations as well. And also, of course, building our commercial business in that competitive environment, which of course returns money back into the public service. I think it, we welcome some of the, the discussions that the UK government are entering into with regards to prominence and how we ensure that public service broadcasters across the UK retain prominence. I think that's really important when we've got license fee payers paying for the license fee and paying for these services that they're able to access them. And, and also that we welcome the conversations on a level playing field. So when we look at how we compete public service broadcasters against these um, competitors globally in the UK that we have a level playing field and we're able to compete successfully with them as well. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Mr. Ruskell, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> Kavina, I'm just going to sort of wrap up a couple of um, points that have been made. So just on, on that last one, um, I mean, the Ofcom review suggests more of a more of a spread of public service media across different providers i'm just wondering what what that does to your relationship with them because it, it's certainly been a bit frosty hasn't it with with some of the online providers the relationship with the bbc and, and others d d does that kind of spread of public service media across different providers does that improve or does that provide a challenge to the to the relationships that you have with them do you see it still as partnership or more competition going forward? Um, well, I think co competition in any market is incredibly important and also important across the public service broadcasting ecology. So we value that we have a range of public service broadcasters in the UK. And actually, that has been essential for some of the, some of the work that's driven the creative sector and the growth in the creative sector, particularly also working with independent production um, companies across the UK and Steve has spoken about the relationships that BBC Scotland has with over 80 independent production suppliers in the UK. So we, we welcome that. What of course we need to do is understand our priorities as a public service broadcaster in that environment and ensure that we are really focused on what our audiences want from us and what makes us distinctive and the role we play in providing universal services to all audiences. Okay, so I would, ju I would just come in to echo uh, sure. uh, that. So, you know, from a Scottish creative sector point of view, you know, I, I f firmly believe is the more people investing money in content creation, the better. Uh, better for audiences, better for the sector that we are all, all building together. So it's, it's brilliant that Amazon, for example, are now, are now shooting drama in Scotland. The, the streamers themselves would say that they value the public service broadcasting ecology in, in Scotland and the UK, that they can't do what they want to do without that broader public service and media infrastructure, which is already there. Okay. So, so one part of that ecology, as you, as you call it, um, perhaps is, is the Kelvin Hall facility, the Kelvin Hall studio. And I'm just interested to know where, where you see that, uh, what contribution you see that capacity bringing going forward and how that, that enhances the ability of the entire sector to produce uh, content from Scotland. 
Yeah, well, certainly going back five or more years, there was a, a there was a problem uh, with broadcast infrastructure in Scotland and the inability to to bring in productions because of lack, for example, of studio space for prescriptive productions. The Kelvin Hall development, as you know, is an initiative funded by Glasgow City Council, Spring Scotland, and others. And uh, you know, it, it's it, it's uh, it's it's uh, I think developing over the next year. Uh, part of the BBC, the commercial studio production arm, BBC Studio Works, I think, are in very advanced discussions with uh, the operators, the owners of uh, the Calvin Hall development, to become the operators of that. You know, again, the intention of the BBC is to grow the creative sector in Scotland as a whole. If you know we can facilitate through our commercial arm, you know, adding more studio infrastructure and encouraging more productions to come in, I think that that's. That's a that's a good thing, but the Kelvin Hall development, you know, is being developed out with the BBC, um, and you know, broadly speaking, new studio infrastructure we've seen in the past few years has attracted additional content, additional demand into the sector. Okay, so that's very much factored into your strategic thinking then going forward, Kelvin Hall. Well, I see Kelvin Hall is a development from Glasgow City Council and others, but the BBC is very clear across the UK strategy is to uh, move. Um, content creation to Scotland and other parts of uh, other nations of the UK, places outside London. Um, I think that's part of what has attracted BBC Studio Works, who's the commercial production studio production arm of the BBC, to engage in, in very close discussions now with the Kelvin Hall uh, developers. Okay. Um, and then finally, if we can come back on the BBC Scotland digital channel as well. I mean, you know, the metrics you've, you've talked about this morning, the, the percentage, uh, you know, two and a half percent. Uh, viewing share. Um, I mean, that obviously compares very well with other digital channels. But I'm, I'm just sort of wondering, does that yeah. now represent a bit of a sort of comfort zone that you're doing pretty well compared to other digital channels? So that that's all great. Or, you know, what, what the long term aspirations are for that channel? And, and, and if it is about substantial growth, um, as I hope it might be, then what, what triggers that? I mean, is it a is it, a, is it a big drama? I'm thinking of, you know, S4C had a, a major hit with Keeping Faith. You know, that went on to BBC and originated in S4C. Is it, is it that type of a, of a trigger that can get more people watching BBC Scotland? Or is it, or is it something else? Is it, is it a big news, you know, event like, I don't know, Indie Ref 2 yeah. or something like that? I mean, what, what, what actually drives this? Or is, it, or is it about slow, you know, continual, moderate growth? in that particular part. Yeah. I, I wouldn't underestimate, and you might argue I would say this, wouldn't I? I wouldn't underestimate the scale of the challenge that was given to Scotland and the wider creative sector in 2017, which is that we want to expand hugely to a, a very significant volume of hours, around 900 uh, original, original hours of programming a year. That's going from you know, a, a sort of a boutique content creation system we had before, where we're making a limited amount of hours that were inserted into BBC One and BBC Two into standing up its own channel. So the very fact that the channel, we've seen other channel launches in the past few years that have not gone quite so well. The very fact that the channel was able to stand up, uh, operate successfully, and attract, as I say, significant audiences. You know, if you look at some of those terrestrial channels, their audience shares might be between five and six percent to be two and a half percent. It is, is genuinely a very strong performance in industry terms. Um, you're absolutely right. Nothing succeeds like success. Having a number of high-profile big hits has been important. In the factual genre, Inside Central Station uh, has been a big hit. Scotland's Home of the Year has been a big hit. Guilt, as I point out, the debut drama comedy on the Scotland Channel, I think, has been a, an enormous creative success, attracted a significant audience on BBC Two, and iPlayer and has come back. I mean, the, the ambition really is to make sure we keep on helping creative people in Scotland backing their ideas, providing pipelines, so you're not just starting off with a sort of a network TV commission. We're, we're able to, to identify, we've, we've eyes and ears on the ground all over Scotland. We can identify new talent through different initiative schemes, services, we can actually start to help them work through. As I say, if the channel was a standalone service in itself, I think you could argue, well, you know, it's, it's viewed in Scotland and that's very important. Because it's available through iPlayer, which is the distribution uh, platform of the future, um, that means many people in Scotland can watch it, but many people in the other nations of the UK can watch it as well. But the overall ambition is to get as many people watching as possible, or to get small groups of people who very highly value a bit of content, and then really just through a very talented commissioning team uh, led by Louise Thornton to really through back talented people to make good programmes. So, so what what does the success look like going forward? Then is it is it maintaining two and a half percent? 
Well, we, we've already exceeded the the the, the reasonable Lofcom projections. Uh, they had a they had one projection which would be for a channel that was uh, bigger budgets. Um, I would like to see as many people watch channel content as possible, either on the linear service or on iPlayer content. And again, as I mentioned before, you know, when you look at our iPlayer performance, it's more than doubled. BBC Scotland commissioned titles more than doubled uh, since channel launch uh, and grew again strongly la that last year as well. So, uh, but it's, you know, I think it needs to have a certain scale and size to stand up as a service, which it does. But equally, as you say, it's about generating stuff that really has high impact and means a lot to people. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would just say on that, and if you sort of, as I, say, I would say this, if you look at awards picked up over the past number of years, the book has digital awards last year. BBC Scotland titles won Best Drama, Best Documentary, and those are the big competitive categories. I bring in Dr. Allen. Thank you. Um, again, a question for, for either or both of you, but um, you mentioned earlier on, quite, quite rightly, how there are certain things a public service broadcaster can do that for example, Netflix can't or doesn't in terms of, in terms of um, providing a variety of, uh, of programmes. Um, can, can I ask how much pressure the BBC is feeling in different age groups when it comes to that competi competition with, with platforms like Netflix and, and where, what things look like in terms of that competition amongst younger age groups? And also related to that, I suppose, um, how Scotland compares with other parts of the UK in terms of people essentially opting out of the, the BBC altogether. I'll, I'll maybe start in Scotland and Lee can give the overall BBC picture. So, you know, as Lee said, competition in any, in any market is good. Creative competition is really good. It keeps everyone on their toes. I think we've seen a rise in production values in, in um, Scottish and, and British broadcasting over the past decade. Um, I, I think to your point, it's not just young audiences are accessing subscription video on demand in large numbers. You can see that middle cohort, 35 to 54, increasingly adopting the same the same patterns. But and yet and yet, you know, 16 to 34 still turn to the BBC and BBC Scotland in very significant numbers. I think the time spent with uh, send the ARA, time spent with BBC is still seven and a half hours a week for 16 to 34 year olds. Now that's, that's, that's a lower number than over 55s. Scotland then, um, briefly, we have a distinctive story to tell as well. So we have unique services that are consumed by young people like the social, short stuff, other things I've mentioned. The channel itself, and this is slightly wonky if you forgive me, the channel itself has a, has a very significant 16 to 34 year old age profile. It's got a unique reach. Um, unique reach are people who consume that service, but no other BBC TV service got a unique reach of 1.7% of 16 to 34s. So that's 1.7% of 16 to 34 year olds in Scotland watch the BBC Scotland channel and no other BBC TV service. So we're bringing people into the BBC portfolio. So there are challenges with young audiences that have been there since I started in broadcasting 30 years ago. Um, but, and yet, and yet, uh, we fight hard at this, but we do remain reach and relevance with, with young audiences. They can give the overall picture, perhaps. Yes, thank you, Steve. I mean, of course, we care. We care passionately about um, our audience reach, and we need to remember that. Dig and digital services um, provide some challenge to that. But of course, we need to remember that 90% of adults use the BBC services on average every week, and 80% of 16 to 34 year olds. And actually, if you look at that over um, a month, you're getting much higher um, with regards to that. So, you know, we, we remain the most used media organization in the UK. And through the pandemic, we were able to further demonstrate the absolute core essential of our, vision, of our mission, which is to inform, educate and entertain. And our ability to maintain that broadcast resilience at a time when we were seeing unprecedented closures in the economy was absolutely essential. But for us to be able to continue to inform our lockdown learning for the children who were no longer at school and our ability to, to continue to entertain. I'm, I'm sure many of us will remember um, the great entertainment that we received from Strictly Come Dancing um, at the end of last year too. Those things were important to the public, were important to audiences. But we, yeah, we, we, are, we are not complacent at all with regards to um, the challenges of the global media organizations, the digital um, digital environment. And that, as I've already explained, our strategy, we believe, is the right one. We have a clear plan 
And we, if we follow through on that, which we absolutely intend to do, it should put the BBC in a brilliant place for its future going forward. Thank you. Ms Bento. Thank you. Um, just, just a very quick question leading on uh, from what uh, Steve was talking about, about the, the audience age range target for the BBC Scotland channel. Um, I'm just interested generally how BBC Scotland is progressing with regard towards its diversity targets, both in front of and behind of the mic or the camera, and also the, the other big news story that the BBC was hit with with regards to equal pay. Uh, yes, so in terms of equal pay, the BBC as a whole, I think, was, was uh, over a number of years out dealing with hundreds of cases, but we're now down into uh, to, to low single figures. Um, it's, it's difficult to talk. Uh, that's across the BBC, I think. Um, it's difficult to talk about that in any more detail without the, running the risk of identifying sure. individuals. But, you know, the overall gender pay gap, uh, which is not, not the same as equal pay, that, mm. that has been reduced to, I think, it's five uh, points. Uh, if I put one percent, um, there shouldn't be any pay gap. But just compared to the to, to, to wider industry, that has that that is a um, a lower figure. Um, diversity is incredibly important. I mean, going back, looking at everything through the audience lens, um, and I think maybe if many of us here can identify with that. You can't properly serve audiences if audiences don't see or hear people who live near them, look like them, sound like them on screen. And then, crucially, the people making the programmes, and this has been a key thing, the people making the programmes also need to follow that. Probably many of us grew up at a time where there wasn't many people uh, from, in my case, Northern Ireland or Scotland being represented uh, as often as possible outside our local services. So the BBC has announced the, uh, what's called the 50 2012 initiative. BBC Scotland's working through that, uh, modelling very carefully um, how we get uh, you know, more people from um, black, Asian, minority ethnic background, more people from the disabled, working with disability background, making sure our gender split is 50-50. Is um, you know, we, we, we're, we're starting from some position strength in some of those categories. It is a challenge, but it's an important one that, as I say, the people making the programmes, people who work directly with the BBC, reflect the audience um, as a whole. Um, that's a very targeted programme, which working with our, our head of HR, Jyoti Singh, over the next three years, and all our hiring managers to make sure we achieve those targets. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just finish with a, a, a final question on, on the back of uh, Ms Minto. Um, so in this, the BBC strategy, it says that it, it's one of the issues is to reflect, re represent and serve the diverse communities of all of the United Kingdom's nations and regions, and in doing so, support the creative economy across the United Kingdom. I, and so the creative economy is very important in Scotland and as we move towards a well-being economy as well, culture is going to be at the, the heart of, of, of that moving forward. Um, so I just want to ask about BBC Radio Scotland, which you, you know did see some big change in approach to some of the lunchtime programmes, uh, removing popular seg segments like the paper review um, uh, and changing the, the, the makeup of that. And, and the uh, particularly the phone-in programmes, and I appreciate this as a personal observation, quite often people that are um, ordinary members of the public that are part of that are you know, the same people over and over again, not a very diverse group of people. And also the opportunities for new programming. I think uh, Dr Allen um, was talking about things like Tutti Frutti. Many of the BBC drama productions or uh, screen productions came from radio in the past mm. and it's just to see is there going to be opportunities for new talent for um new music talent being showcased and for new 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 drama and new opportunities for people on on bbc radio scotland um yes i think uh, just to note that you're right we made several significant changes to schedules and then retuned individual programs uh in breakfast lunchtime and, and drive time uh, early last year, just just before lockdown, um, um, I think I think creatively and from the audience response, we can see, including streaming, digital streaming. I think that's been uh, been important, and those services, all new services, have been so vital during during COVID, including our online services. We've had 37 million requests to view our COVID page on on COVID in Scotland. Um, unfortunately, we actually can't measure our normal radio figures because during lockdown, the radar measurement tool. Which involves face-to-face -face contact has stopped. Delighted it started started back again. Um, I'll take away your comment on our on our phone-ins about the the the, the, the contributors. Um, I'll discuss that with the production team. We, as you say, radio drama has been traditionally a very good place to develop new drama. 
uh, we have a very successful radio drama team here in BBC Scotland uh, making uh, a lot of network radio drama, um, and they've actually recently won a very significant uh, podcast award. Um, there are other pipelines now to develop. So, for example, if you look at iPlayer, the series Float I mentioned, that's, uh, that's a new pipeline to develop uh, TV drama that, that wasn't obviously there a few years ago. That's, that's through BBC Writers Room and in partnership with Screen Scotland. Um, music's an incredibly important part of our radio portfolio. Uh, you know, we've got BBC introducing for new music through. And again, the way we're organised is that you know, we've multi-platform production teams. So if you look at a digital strand, music strand like, uh, like Loop, or tune, uh, arts and music. They exist for younger audiences in the social digital space. We also then can put that uh, in TV terms on the BBC Scotland channel. So, you know, I think I think arts and culture are incredibly, incredibly important to all audiences in Scotland. As we know, it's not just a sort of more um, a wealthier audience. Uh, there's fantastic innovation in Scottish music and in the arts, and I do think we've got a range of services that cover that. But we're, we're always looking at that and seeing what we can do to to make sure we are identifying and nurturing talent at all levels. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Carson and Ms. Tavitziva, thank you very much for your contribution this morning. Uh, I'm going to suspend for five minutes while uh, witnesses are, are swapped over. Thank you.
And welcome back. Um, our next agenda item is pre-budget scrutiny of the culture sector funding. As part of its pre-budget scrutiny work, the committee has currently looking at the continuing impact of COVID-19 on the culture sector and its longer-term future. This morning, the committee will hear from Paul McManus, Negotiations Officer for Scotland at BEC2, Barry Dolman, Acting Regional Organiser for Scotland and Northern Ireland Regional at the Musicians' Union. And can I welcome you both to the meeting this morning and also thank you and the others who have provided written evidence for today's session. Given the time constraints, we're going to move straight to questions this morning. And I, I, I just know, um, to let you know, Miss Boyack is um, appearing remotely this morning. So can I remind members if they direct question, if they could direct it to the, the, a particular witness, that would be helpful. And I'm going to move straight to questions from Mr Cameron. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, my question is around emergency funding that has been um, distributed uh, to the, the, the culture sector um, over the last uh, year or so. Um, it, it, for example, I think a month ago, £17 million uh, pounds was distributed through Creative Scotland. And my question is really to, to both of you, uh, which is, is it... Um, is it reaching your members either directly or indirectly? Perhaps, um, uh, um, Mr. McManus first. Yeah. In some in some respects, it is indeed reach, reaching the members. In uh, sadly, in a lot of respects, it is not. There are still a great many. Uh, freelancers, people working various types of arrangements in the live event sector and the theatre sector who desperately need support and who haven't got it. Uh, there have been some issues between where people fall in terms of Event Scotland, Creative Scotland, Screen Scotland, which has led to a significant number of gaps. Uh, for people who are more based around theatres, uh, uh, no. Uh, very often they haven't. Employers are relying essentially on the furlough scheme, uh, and a number of a number of organisations have used emergency funding to fu future proof their box offices rather than in supporting staff. Mr. Dolman, do you want to come in? Yes, I would agree broadly with uh, what. Paul said that I mean the particularly the hardship funding for creative freelancers provided through Creative Scotland during the pandemic has been an essential lifeline for some of them. But there are many of our members that haven't been eligible for various reasons to do with the the, the nature of their portfolio careers or the way that they operate. Um, I would agree that some of the emergency funding that's gone to um, institutions hasn't necessarily been used in all cases to support workers and again particularly freelancers I think have been disproportionately affected um, because of course they weren't eligible for the furlough scheme so the funding that has been available been made available and where members have received it it has been absolutely essential for them um, but unfortunately there are a lot of people that have been excluded from the way that things have been implemented um, both particularly I would say from the from the Westminster government um, but also just because of the way they, they operate and the rules around access to funding. So thank you for those answers. I mean, is there a, is there a sort of tension between funding that goes to organisations uh, and, you know, be that um, you know, theatres or, or whatever it might be, uh, and not going to individuals? I mean, is, is, that, is that a difficulty that... that, that Funding might go directly to a, to a small local organisation, but theref therefore not reach individuals, or, or, or is that not right? Mr. McManus, in, 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 in my opinion, I think it's, it's more to do with the, the, the criteria around what the funding can be used for and the way in which that is, is monitored or, or managed. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is if, you know, uh, there was a there was a clear intent to try and support freelancers by the by the Scottish government, uh, and we see we saw organisations like the Lyceum engage immediately in in whole scale redundancies. But during COVID, they then started hiring freelance 
designers and directors more than they've ever used in the past. So, uh, on the face of it, they're saying, well, we're supporting the freelance community. And they say, well, you'd never have used that many freelancers in the first place. So, you know, staff, were, staff lost their jobs uh, and, and some freelancers gained more work out of it. So, uh, we don't feel that the monitoring of the, the way in which the money was used was as robust as perhaps it should have been. Having said that, there are, there are clear examples where, you know, theatres absolutely 110% supported their staff, their zero hours contracts, their freelancers all the way through. So it was really left down to the, the ambitions and the intentions of the, the organisations themselves as to whether or not they used the money, in our view, to the benefit of the, of the workers and the staff or, or whether they didn't. Yeah, Mr. Tillman? Yeah, I would agree with that, that it, that it varies from um, organisation to organisation. And it's obviously very difficult when trying to move at speed and, and get money out there when we know it's, it's needed, but also having the ability to properly uh, dictate what should be done with that money and the way in which it should be used. I think my members are probably slightly different from, from Paul's in that Paul probably has um, slightly more employed members than, than than I would. My my members are main who are employed are mainly uh, would be things like orchestral musicians, um, perhaps teachers in some respects. Generally, the orchestras in in Scotland have have looked after um, the musicians very well. I would say um, the majority of of them have have really tried to um, take care of their their employees and um, in some cases have gone beyond what they were legally obliged to do. If you like, even when implementing. The, the furlough scheme. Um, what, the, the problem for, for those organisations, though, has been where they work regularly with, with freelancers. And, and say, for example, a symphony orchestra would supplement um, its core players as needed, depending on the nature of a production, bringing in extra players where a bigger orchestra is required, or using freelancers to cover absences from the, from the core player uh, team. And that's that's just not happened at all during the pandemic. So those freelancers aren't getting the work that they they needed. But obviously, the the funding given to the orchestra, it, it, I mean, actually, some orchestras have given some support to freelancers. But but you know, the, the the money that's given to them is not there to support freelancers. So obviously, they're going to look after their the the primary responsibility, which is the orchestra and their employees. So. My, I would say my member's situation is slightly different, but I, I, I would agree with the premise of your question that there is perhaps some tension sometimes between funding given to organisations and how that then translates through, through to the workforce. But I think probably the, the key point that Paul made is it, it is kind of on an organisation by organisation basis, and it's quite hard to, be, to make generalisations about that because it's been very different across the country. Thank you. Can I bring in Ms. Boyack, please? Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Um, it's good to see you both with us today. Can I follow up those initial points about um, people losing their jobs over the last year? Obviously, when just performances, live performances, just had to stop entirely. Have we got any sense of how many people we've actually lost from the arts and culture sector? Um, there have been press articles about uh, freelancers not getting support and basically having to go and get other employment. I would actually say that there is as significant a problem in terms of staff as, as it is with freelancers. In, in terms of the freelancers, it was, it was fairly straightforward. There was no work for any of them, uh, and they were all scrambling about trying to access the, the, the emergency support, which, which was available. The, the bigger issue now facing the culture sector is encouraging staff to come back. Uh, you know, the, the Playhouse Theatre was scheduled to do a show on the Sunday. They were 20 staff short uh, if that performance had gone ahead. I spoke to a, a deputy chief uh, theatre electrician yesterday who said, when the Fernald Scheme men's ball, I'm not going back. I make more money driving for Just Eat than I ever made working in the theatre. So when I get my weekends off, I'm not going back. That story has been repeated countless times. Theatre employers across Scotland are said to me that they're advertising to open a brand new theatre. There are thousands of people being lost to the industry, both freelance and staff. There's a great many freelancers 
have moved into uh, film and TV, moved into other industries. And, and it, you know, as I say, to the level, the number of conversations I've had with people who are much happier driving for Amazon or Just Eat now, and, you know, they love the theatre, but they don't want to go back to the, the kind of low-pay, long-hour culture. So it, it's probably the biggest single challenge facing the cultural industries just now is the loss of staff. Okay. Mr. Tolman? Yes, I would agree with that. It's very difficult to put a number on the, the on, on on how many people have left the the profession. Um, we actually don't know, and we won't know for some time because things still aren't operating as normal, if you like. Um, I can tell you that when we did an impact study of our own members, this is this is UK wide, and um, the thirty two thousand members that that we represented back in September twenty twenty. Um, a third of musicians, so around 34%, were considering leaving the industry completely because of the financial hardship that they'd suffered. 70% um, of musicians were unable to undertake more than a quarter of their usual work in 2020. And nearly half of them, around 47%, had been forced to seek work outside of the industry. And that was back in September 2020. And then obviously we had a subsequent lockdown in January, so that will only have exacerbated the situation. From a music point of view and from my members' point of view, we haven't seen too many redundancies. Fortunately, um, many of the orchestras are, are funded um, publicly, so um, they've been able to access the, the government support schemes to keep people in, in, in employment. So we haven't seen too many redundancies in the music industry, but what we have seen is the complete decimation of, of freelance work. And it's not clear how many of those people are going to be able to return, how many of them have, have, have hung on, um, and how many of them, if they do come back, will come back in the same capacity that they did before, or whether they're going to be part-time in the, in the industry. And it's going to take some time before we see the skills drain really impact mm -hmm. on the cultural landscape, because this could be anything from people who provide instrumental lessons children in, in schools. It could be quality freelance orchestral players, um, meaning that the, the symphony orchestras and the opera orchestras in the country can't get the quality of players that they, that they need. Um, and the knock-on effect is just unknown at the moment, but it's, it is there, it is real, and I think we're going to experience it in years to come. Just very hard to quantify at the moment. Ms. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much, Convener. I suppose that takes us to there's the short term crisis, which you both speak about very eloquently. So, in terms of our thoughts about going into this year's budget, um, there's issues about venues, which you both mentioned, but the, the issue about having performers, having all the staff that put performances on. I've met Culture Counts and the Nighttime Industry Association, and they're, they're all very focused on. What do we do next? And I'm just wondering about what your thoughts are. Um, you know, the issue about school tuition, that's local authority funding. Um, are there issues about how employment is structured going forward so that we attract people to stay in the industry or to come into the industry? Um, and, and what about the debate about um, the percent for art debate? I think it's 0.2 percent. So one of our briefings is currently spent on culture um, by the Scottish Government. So do we need to do we need to change how, how money is spent and invest more? Um, I'd be interested in both of your views on that. Mr McManus, in the end first, thanks. I'm sorry, Kavina. Uh, yes, I think there needs to be a fundamental rethink of how the, the cultural industries are supported. Uh, there have been a great many meetings with civil servants over the past week with, you know, based on recent announcements and universally across the live events, across the cultural sector, the staff shortages at all levels has been pretty much at the top of the agenda, uh, whether it's front of house staff, whether it's stewards, whether it's technical staff, whether it's freelancers. Uh, there needs to be a fundamental rethink of, of how these industries are, are supported. Uh, I think we'd like to see, you know, longer term funding. I think we would like to see a significantly greater percentage spent on culture. Because in the in in the live arts, the 
theatres are very much the bottom of the food chain. People are working on the minimum wage for long hours, zero hour contracts, and even the permanent employees are, uh, are, are you know, at the bottom of, of the food chain. And a great many of them have seen the, the rapid expansion of film and TV and taken their skills into film and TV where they can work significantly less hours and, and earn two or three times the amount of money they're, they're earning in theatre. Uh, yeah. Live events is, is facing a slightly different challenge because a lot of the problems that are now coming on them uh, are driven by uh, Brexit, but I won't sidetrack into that discussion just now. So I think what we need to see, what we'd like to see is the Scottish Government becoming much more focused in terms of how it supports organisations, stop trying to you know, give everybody a wee bit to help them by and really sit down and support uh, training and reskilling initiatives in a strategic way. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, they have to build in the, you know, the likes of the Fair Work First principles and help to drive the uh, wages and conditions up to acceptable levels. Never, never mind that, you know, high standards. Uh, if they don't, if they don't do that, they're just there's going to be a constant struggle. So more focused, more longer term support is is what's needed now, and significantly more support. Mr. Tolman? Yeah, again, it's hard to disagree with, with anything Paul said there. I mean, I think the, there are two um, priorities, really. The, the first has to be to retain the people that we need in the industry going forward. And I think one of the key things I wish to stress is that although there are uh, certain things that are happening again now, events are happening, live performances are happening, theatres are reopening and so on, it's going to be a long time before freelancers can build up the portfolio of work to allow themselves to be financially sustainable in the way that they were before the pandemic. And let's not kid ourselves, many of them you know, were, were not making huge amounts of money then, they were barely scraping by. So we cannot take the view, if we want to support this sector, that now that things are opening and people can work again, that's all fine and it's back to normal, because it's not. And if we don't provide immediate short-term financial support, particularly for freelancers, then we're going to see continued hardship. We're going to see continually people leaving the sector and the skills train that we, we talked about before. In terms of, of how we approach things in the longer term, I think, firstly, a commitment to, promoting, to approaching things in a long-term manner would be helpful. Part of the problem at the moment with the, the sector in general is the kind of um, siloing of different activities because they're assigned to different budget holders, money's coming from different places. So, for example, what we might choose to do in music education is often not tied in with what we would do in terms of cultural events or music tourism. And a, a more integrated approach between all the different funding uh, bodies or budget holders based on what we want the industry or the cultural sector in Scotland to look like in 10, 20 years' time. A, a more holistic, um, big-picture view would be helpful so that all the individual parts can, can work together to deliver that. I think too much in terms of, of, of funding, whether that we're talking about local authority funding for things like the Youth Music Initiative, um, funded through Creative Scotland, which provides uh, music provision for primary schools, um, or, um, or say, funding to, to orchestras and, and theatres, those kind of things are done very much on an annual basis. And it makes it very, very difficult for organisations to plan ahead. Um, what you find is even where people are potentially employed, they're only on short-term contracts because the organisations can't guarantee the position next year because their funding is only for 12 months and then they have to go through the reapplication process again. So uh, the Youth Music Initiative I mentioned is a good, a good example. There are some of those programmes that have been running through local authorities but for 20 years, but every year they have to go through the reapplication process. And this creates uncertainty and um, kind of short-term thinking in the way things that are done. Longer-term planning with, with guaranteed funding over a longer period would allow publicly funded organisations to, to, to be more... Um, be more resourceful, really, and to make more of the money because they can plan far farther ahead. 
and not be constantly worrying about whether they're going to have the money to do whatever it is that they want to do next year. I think the other key thing that we that we need to do, and this probably will, or well, certainly will require any a commitment uh, to more to more spending, is to ensure that uh, work principles go into the heart of the cultural landscape. There's been I've been involved in in some meetings uh, recently with officials talking about about how we implement fair work and the the one thing that that I think is quite clear is is if we want this in Scotland we have got absolutely no chance of persuading commercial organisations that they have to adopt fair work principles if it's not being done in organisations that are funded publicly so one of the uh, one of the things that we need to do is ensure that where public money is being spent and where people are engaged through publicly funded um, organisations or schemes, that they are being paid fairly, that the conditions are as they should be, that they, they have job security and all the other principles of, of fair work. And in order to do that, that's going to require, require increased resources. We talked earlier about when money is distributed to organisations, what happens to it from there? And I think part of the problem at the moment is for an organisation, say like Creative Scotland, does not have the resources or the remit or the instruction to go and follow up and ensure that the money is spent in ways that it was purported to be. So there's no uh, checks and balances against organisations who might secure public money under one application and then choose to do something slightly different with it or they're not paying the workers what they, they said they would. So a more uh, holistic view with longer term funding, with fair work at the heart of it, and a government commitment to put the money in to ensure that that's, that that's possible is probably what we, we need, as well as a more integrated um, uh, communication between the bodies that are responsible for funding the cultural landscape. Thank you. Ms Boyack, are you finished with questions? I, that, that was really helpful. Thanks, convener. I suppose it, in terms of longer term planning, obviously for certain types of culture where you've got performances moving around the country, um, those venues are already thinking about not just this year, but the next two years. Um, so that point is very well made about the public sector needing to think about longer term funding, whether it's three or five years as well. I think that's something for the committee to reflect on. Thanks, convener. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Ms Weber, please? Okay. Thank you very much, Convener. I, uh, first, I was looking through the submissions today, and you've mentioned that the UK music industry, specific Mr. Dolman, in, is suggesting it could be a, a three-year recovery cycle. Um, and if you've been uh, listening to the news, which I'm sure you are, that you'll know that later today that the government in Scotland is likely to vote for vaccine certification to be introduced. So I'm wondering how that might impact on the recovery for your sector and what will be needed either to compensate, financially support, implement, uh, manage uh, in these uh, passports uh, for access to venues and for live events. Mr Dolman, can I bring you in first this time? Sorry, I'm upsetting uh, broadcasting at the moment. Mr Dolman, and then I'll come to the Thank you. Thank um, you. Yes, it does seem that that's likely to happen in in Scotland. The musicians' union, in in principle, um, isn't against um, additional measures at festivals and events and, and concerts. One of the, obviously the big concern that we have with vaccination certification is that it's potentially discriminatory. So we we you know we would hope that um, any measure introduced like that would also allow use of things like recent negative tests, on-site testing, or whatever it is, to allow people who are unable to be vaccinated due to underlying medical conditions or, or what have you, um, wouldn't be excluded from taking part in those cultural activities. In terms of what the, the industry needs, the, the problem with that, of course, for festivals, venues, events, is that they are then going to be responsible for checking the certification for dealing with the people as they arrive. And in terms of security, administration, staffing levels, that's going to put increased costs um, on those events and venues at a time when they are already 
massively struggling. So the concern is how that's going to be, be implemented and what support is going to be given to them to allow them to carry out the instructions of the government if that does indeed go through today. Okay, Mr McManus. Thanks, convener. Uh, but as, as Barry has outlined, there, there are obviously logistical challenges about implementing these proposals. I think the consensus of the feedback I've had from members, though, is why well, just events over 10,000? I work in a theatre that's got 1,700 people. I've got no idea if these people are vaccinated or are infected or anything. Why am I not protected by having to check for COVID vaccinations? Uh, for, for all events, and, and why the difference between nightclubs and other sectors. Surely, if it's, if it's a good principle, then it should apply to everybody. Uh, it will undoubtedly uh, add logistical challenges, and I think that the Scottish Government could, could help significantly by working with the industry to come up with whatever technical solutions, digital solutions, to make it as seamless as possible. Uh, but again, in line with comments we made earlier, I think the government needs to be more robust in uh, in any support it gives. And what I mean by that is that you know the likes of Ambassador Theatre Group received three hundred about three hundred thousand in emergency funding at a time that they were trying to drive through reductions in terms and conditions of employment and laying staff off. And that's a company that makes twenty million pounds a year profit. So again, a great many of our members said, well, why have we forgotten all the profits they've made in previous years? Uh, surely they should put their, their own hands in their pockets. So there's some, some huge organisations, hugely successful commercial organisations, and I'm talking across, you know, uh, football, live events, culture, uh, who should have to bear some of the cost of this and some of the inconvenience. You know, it's a, it's a public health issue. If people have to queue a bit longer or it costs a bit more to get them in and that there's a bit of a hit in the profits of that, then uh, that's a price worth paying to ensure people's safety. Because, again, fear of COVID is one of the, you know, is a big factor in people not returning to the cultural industries. Because all of a sudden, having gone from being at home or, you know, working online, they're suddenly faced with getting back into buildings with, you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000 people facing them. And that, that's a, a big stress factor for people uh, in not returning to the industry. So, I suppose so I think that, 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 you know, sorry. No, that was all right. <laughs> I was going to have a very quick follow up then just on that one, just to ask. So, have you been consulted at all uh, in how and what shape these the enforcement and the checking will take place. Have you had any discussions with the Scottish Government regarding that? Hey, I, I think I've been in four meetings now since the First Minister's <laughs> announcement with the Scottish Government about COVID, about the proposals. Okay. So, yes, we are being consulted extensively on it. OK. Um, can I have a, a second question? Thank you. Uh, so I was reading in the Beck to a written submission, you speak about the expectations and ambitions of your workers across the sector has changed significantly. And I'm making the assumption that relates to some of the fair work principles we've heard. But I was looking for a bit more detail and specifics behind that statement, because you've also said that the essence of the industry is the live experience and that that is unlikely to change. So I'm just wondering if there's potentially a conflict between what the consumer expectation is and what the uh, working, uh, you know, in terms of that fair work, will there be conflict and how might that hamper or be an opportunity in terms of you going forward in your recovery? I'm just trying to weigh up where that might sit. Mr McManus. Well, my, uh, my understanding uh, across the, the live events and theatre sector as a whole is that organisations just want to get back to doing what they have always done. They want to get the doors open, they want to get the public in, and, and they don't see uh, any significant change in, in trends. They believe the public wants to get back in and, and see shows. The, the issue w which are raised in there is in terms of the staff in, in theatres and live events they don't want to work in that in this industry anymore. 
their expectations have changed uh, as as many other people have done across many other sectors like hospitality uh, uh, and whether or not the government puts more support on the table or changes its approach the industry will need to change its approach there are there are theaters and venues out there just now who cannot function because they don't have the staff coming back or the freelancers available to service their needs. As I said, you know, the Playhouse wanted to do a show on Sunday with, with 20, 20 uh, staff short. Uh, that, would, that would have caused chaos if they had tried to go ahead with the show. Other theatres around the country, producing theatres, rural theatres, are saying, we just don't have the staff. This is going to be an issue for us. We're not, shows are going to be affected. And they're coming round to the realisation now, they're starting to be conversations now to say, how much do we have to increase our rates of pay and our improve our conditions of employment in order to get people to come and work for us? That's that's a live conversation that's going on just now. But, but similarly, you you know, you've got the big commercial operators who are who are essentially saying, Well, you know, we're just going to plough ahead regardless. We're not going to be improving terms and conditions. They, they spent most of COVID trying to trying to reduce them, uh, yeah. and and there's there's going to be real tensions there going forward, regardless of what we think, regardless of what the government does. That is that is, is a big issue just now, and I think the government can help alleviate it, uh, but but it, it needs addressed urgently. Theatres are facing these problems. Live events are facing these problems right now. Nightclubs are facing these problems right now. That's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr Allen? Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if we could ask uh, Mr Dolman about uh, a question that uh, I know his organisation and others have raised in the past, which is about the impact of uh, the loss of freedom of movement uh, around Europe on, on what your members do. Um, obviously, the situation, I'm sure, varies from European country to European country to some extent, possibly. I don't know. But what, what is involved uh, in, if you can give examples, in um, artists in Scotland seeking to work in the EU now? I would love to be able to answer that with 100% certainty. The problem is that there is still a huge amount of, of uncertainty around exactly what is required for musicians and artists on tour. This is another time bomb that we've got coming down the, the line. The only reason it's not a bigger issue than that it would be at this stage post uh, the withdrawal from the European Union is because COVID's kept everyone from touring. But as we emerge now, and hopefully live music will, will continue to be allowed to resume, then people are going to want to tour. And they're going to find that there are huge problems and barriers that didn't exist previously in the way. One thing I want to stress is it's not just about the freedom of movement of individuals in order to work, although at the moment every European country that you go to will have different requirements. It's not always clear what they are in terms of visas and or work per permits. Um, and you know we're continually pressuring the, the UK government to, to try and get some reciprocal agreement with the EU to allow musicians on tour to move freely between those those countries but it's not just about the individuals themselves it's about the vehicles that they take with their equipment in it's about the equipment that they're taking and customs regulations it's about cabotage rules which involve um transport vehicles and whether the transit van for example can can cross more than one border on a on a tour it's about what's required in terms of customs paperwork for taking their merchandise to to sell and all of these other things that are now um, problematic post Brexit that weren't previously are huge condition, are huge threats to the touring industry, and hugely restrictive. And it's going to be a real problem. Yes, the, the freedom of movement for people is is massive, and we desperately need a reciprocal agreement on that. But that alone will not solve the problem for touring musicians. There's a whole host of other factors that we desperately need the government to start addressing because otherwise. It's going to be prohibitive, and there's going to be a whole, a whole uh, chain of events set in motion by that continuing impact on the industry, lack of loss of reputation. The UK is one of the only net exporters of music in the world. That's going to be seriously under threat if UK artists can't tour the EU. Which, given the size of of the UK as a as an island and the number of people in it, the number of venues, the EU has been our domestic market 
if you like, and being able to travel freely and play in those countries has allowed musicians to build up a fan base, become self-sustainable in ways that, that they just can't do as things stand at the moment. So it's a massive threat. It's going to cause huge problems down the, down the line, and we desperately need something done about it as soon as possible. Also, related to that, in that case, uh, are there funding streams um, that in the past you accessed from the EU that you, you think you'll notice um, you're not accessing once you do get back to touring? I'm thinking of things like Creative Europe, funding streams like that. Is that, is that a major consideration for you when you're planning ahead? Or? I mean, it depends, on, it depends on levels and it depends on, on artists. I mean, I, I think the, the problems around the, the increased administration costs and red tape of, of, of touring will not affect the, the top level artists. You know, people who are household names will they'll put two or three pounds on the price of a of a of, a, of an already three figure stadium concert ticket, and that will cover it. It's the it's the grassroots, it's the emerging artists, it's the it's the 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 bands who are who have a following domestically, but need to get out and broaden that fan base and need to to develop their audience. And they're the people that would be reliant on funding and would be reliant on on support mechanisms to allow them to tour in order to build up that reputation and fan base. And it might well be that those that those funding sources are significantly reduced through through Brexit. Um, it's certainly another factor that's going to make it harder for people to talk. Thank you, Kinderino. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bento. Okay, um, I'd like to thank you for, for joining us. Um, it's been very, very informative. Thank you, convener. Um, kind of following on from Dr. Allen's questions, I'm, also, I'm interested to hear a bit more about the touring that we hopefully will be able to start seeing happening within, within Scotland. Um, and also um, your thoughts on the fund that the Scottish Government introduced through the programme of government um, to get musicians and um, theatre companies out to the rural, rural, more rural areas um, who are also crying out for um, much more um, culture and creativity to come back to their areas. Um, I, I live on Isla uh, and there's a, a very successful fa festival, Cantalina, which brings in young musicians as well. So I'm interested to hear about what the MU is, is doing to try and support young musicians again, because clearly through lockdown, their education will have been um, in their own rooms online and what, what kind of support structures that um, you would suggest that are needed to ensure that we continue the throughput of the, the emerging artists um, in Scotland. Thank you. Brent Manis, if he wants to uh, that's a, a... Mr. Dolman, yeah. Sorry, uh, that, that's uh, yeah. It's I mean, it's a, it's a very big question. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, you, you're quite right. You know, access to music education was was much much harder. Um, certainly, as a union, we try to support our members that that teach um, by giving them advice about providing lessons online, about advocating for 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 online lessons, encouraging schools to um, move their peripatetic tuition online, and help the teachers have the equipment and. Uh, training that they needed in order to carry out those lessons safely and, and effectively. I think the the digital activity that's that's come about because of the pandemic it is probably going to be one of the, the the few upsides, one of the few positives in that people are now much more familiar with using technology in that way, are much more open to the idea of, of working remotely. Um, and for for musicians and students in, in rural areas, particularly who might not have local access to the quality of teachers that they need or, um, you know, the, the musical activity that they can see physically in person, a greater emphasis on the digital side of things can help to, to join the dots a little bit more. Um, but I would agree with you that it's hugely important that, that regardless of where you live, that you do have access to cultural experiences because it's those experiences that can inspire you or light light a fire in you that that set you on the path to go and to go and become a professional musician or an actor or an artist or, or whatever it happens to to be um i know certainly many of many of my uh 
personal friends who are, who are musicians were inspired by seeing a particular orchestra or a band or um, being taken with the school to go and see a production of something and suddenly you know a world that they didn't even know existed was was open to them so i think it is vitally important um, particularly particularly where you do have um kind of concentration of of activities around major cities that the that government does try and and encourage that activity to be taken across the whole country and provide that kind of access and opportunity to as many people as possible without them having to come to the to the cities all the time so i support those kind of initiatives and i think the the digital access is good and we should look at expanding that to help join the dots but there is no substitution for the in-person experience so we need to focus on that as well and i thoroughly support that okay mr mcmanus do you want to come in on this uh, please, yes. I, I think the, the one comment I'd, I'd make is that it goes back to what we're talking about, the funding, uh, uh, to support this type of rural and outreach work. Uh, and it goes back to the strategic thinking. If we look at the, the Eden Court in, in Inverness, which is a long history of doing very successful outreach work uh, out into the highlands and islands, uh, yet, you know, I had to cut scale back in that work in recent years because of uh, local authority cutbacks. So while there's am ambitions from a number of organisations to uh, to do this type of work and to support it on an ongoing basis, we've got two challenges, constant local authority cutbacks, and again, back to the annual funding cycle, particularly smaller organisations that are trying to support this. You know, and, and I mentioned the, the Visions Initiative in my, in my submission. You know, our managers spend half the year lobbying for public funding to support the following year's work. That public funding is sitting in somebody's bank account for four, five, six months till we get it agreed, and then we've got four or five, six months to spend it, and then the whole cycle restarts all over again. And more strategic funding would allow people to spend less time and money in an administrative processes and more more time actually supporting the uh, the delivery of such valuable initiatives. But uh, convenient for me, I just wanted to make one quick point in relation to the last question about the, the, the European situation. You know, because for every musician that goes out and tour around Europe, there's anything from 20 to 200 support staff and, and truck drivers and, and all the rest of it that goes with them. And in the UK, is a net exporter of that talent and a great many of the of the bigger american companies come into scotland come into england pick up their whole crew because they prefer to work with english-speaking crews and then tour them take them around europe but equally many of our members they don't just go with one band or one act and do a tour and come home again they've got integrated networks with european companies that mean they spend anything between you know, eight to ten months a year touring around Europe. When one act finishes and heads home, they join another tour or they join another company. The, the, their whole work and lives are planned in that. And those people are now either moving to Europe or have left the industry. Because they're saying, if I've lost nine, ten months, now I'm not going to get that work back in Scotland. You know, and, it, and that goes across TV as well. If you look at all the sports coverage, Formula One, you know, the golf, the tennis, it tends to be the same crews who follow the tour. That talent's been lost because those people have now moved to Europe. They're thinking, well, I can live without the couple of months of work I got in Scotland, but I can't live without the 10 months of work I got in Europe in the Middle East. So they've, they've relocated. Yeah. So, you know, that is as barry said that's a you know that, that train's already started since january we have seen the big european companies the big crew companies in europe primarily in holland germany and poland advertising for the normal levels of crew with uk passport passport holders need not apply that's affected hundreds of, of members in scotland thousands across the uk thank you Ms. um I thank you for that. Um, that was a very stark picture you painted there, Mr. McManus. Um, I'd, I'd like to move back as well to the, 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 the tours and the fact that we, we have festivals that have musicians coming across 
um, from Europe and the, um, as well. So it, it's thoughts on how that's impacting on the work that our musicians are doing. And I suppose in some respects, what I've heard from musicians is they're concerned about um, the, the creativity and the sparking off others, other traditions from other, um, other countries across Europe. Just some thoughts on that and if there was anything that in the, the funding we can, uh, looking forward at the budget, there's anything that we can do to support with that, following on from what um, Dr Allen was saying about losing out from Culture Europe. So, Mr. Mr. McManus, uh, oh, Mr. Do well, mm -hmm. I'll bring in Mr. McManus and then Mr. Dolman. I'm sure mm -hmm. they both want to, to contribute. I, th I think what we expect to see is that the, the costs of running those festivals uh, will increase or the quality will decrease. Because, as, as Barry pointed out there, the bigger acts, you know, some of them may well be able to afford the increased administration costs of, of moving uh, between Europe and, and the UK. The, the smaller acts, the ones who are trying to establish themselves, and, and probably some of the types of acts that you would see, particularly in, in you know in festivals across Scotland, mm -hmm. they just simply won't come. It would be too costly, too administrative, and you know. As Barry said, if you think about the logistics under the current rules of trying to get a transit van's worth of gear, you know, across Europe and into the uh, into the UK, uh, the feedback we're getting from from an awful lot of colleagues in Europe is they're just not going to come. So you either find a lot more money to hire the bigger acts that can afford to come, or you lo you lose that quality. And equally. The, the other impact, which already and uh, quite a number of music promoters are talking about, is if they do choose to come from Europe to the UK, you're not getting the same experience. We'll 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 fly the you know we'll fly the artist in and they'll get a bare stage with a few lights because we're not bringing our whole experience across to to the UK because it's just prohibitively you know expensive and logistically impact impractical. Mr. Dolman. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the one of the, the the key issues is is well, the key issue is really not so much at this stage about about funding. I think that's a conversation for well, not a conversation, but certainly something that will need to kick in a little farther down the line. The key problem at the moment is the logistics of getting people in and out of the country to perform, and both in terms of of say Scottish festivals booking European artists come and perform on their on their bills and provide that access. To the live experience that we talked about before as being so transformative and so vital in inspiring the next generation of of artists and, and musicians um that's just going to be more difficult to happen now simultaneously scottish and uk artists are going to lose out in terms of getting opportunities to play at festivals and events in europe because it's going to be so much harder to book musicians from this country than it is to book them from other countries in europe so it's just easier and cheaper just not to bother, and that reduces the lack of reduces the opportunities available for everyone. It reduces access to music and performances for audiences in in Scotland, but it also uh, reduces opportunities for musicians um, playing abroad. And also, yes, in terms of of collaborations, again, the advantage of of digital technology has allowed people to start working with musicians in other countries very very easily, and after an initial perhaps digital collaboration, many musicians would then go and and gig with artists that they've been collaborating, collaborating with in, in EU countries, and they're probably not going to be able to do that now. So what we're likely to find if we don't get some resolution on, on making it easier for people to move and work in this industry is the industry is going to become smaller, more insular, with fewer opportunities, more isolated, and that's just going to have a, a, a damaging impact both on the financial aspect, but also the broader cultural aspect and, and the value and role that the cultural and music sectors play in our society at large. I think in terms of, of funding, what we will need is inevitably, even with some, some better reciprocal agreements in place that may reduce some of the logistical issues we've been talking about, is it's undoubtedly going to be more expensive for artists to tour Europe, regardless of what agreements are in place. There are going to be administrative requirements that they're going to have to fulfil 
it is going to be logistically more difficult. It's going to take more time. It's going to cost them more money. And again, as we've been stressing, it's not the, it's not the, the household names that will be hit by this. It's artists that previously would have been at the stage in their careers where they now need to go to Europe and start developing a fan base abroad. They're just not going to be able to. So where the Scottish government can help is perhaps to provide some funding to enable touring to happen and to make it easy and offset some of those those costs. Um, one of the things that UK music have been, been calling for uh, is for the government to set up a, a UK music office to help with the export of of music and some ring fence funding to help touring musicians in Scotland from the Scottish government um, could do something particularly for, for, for this country as well. But that's where they're going to need support where it comes to the point where they just can't talk because it's not, it's not viable for them. That's where the government can help. But from a Scottish point of view, the bigger problem though is the UK government and the reciprocal agreements that we need to make it easier for people to move and work in the first place. Okay, thank, thank you. you. They bring in Mr Ruskell. Yeah, thanks very much. I thought those were really interesting answers, uh, really pressing problems at the moment. Um, can I just sort of pull things back out, though, to the, to the bigger picture? Um, we've got this national performance framework in Scotland. There are kind of four indicators around, you know, on the dashboard, if you like, about our cultural health, um, attendance at cultural events, participation and activity, growth in the cultural economy, and the numbers of people working in arts and culture. I wonder if you've got views on whether that adequately kind of describes, shows us where we are in terms of the health of this sector and, and our cultural health more, more broadly. I'm sort of minded, you know, looking at your submissions, particularly whether that metric around just the numbers of people working in arts and culture really adequately describes what's going on in terms of fair work, uh, insecurity of, of contracts and, and, and other issues. So what, do you have thoughts on, on how that could perhaps be improved or are these metrics on the dashboard the right ones to be thinking about right now as we recover from COVID? Okay. I'll bring in Mr McManus and Mr Dolman. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have an issue with the, the metrics of, of the dashboard. I think there needs to be a, a rethink on the, the emphasis of, of how we achieve a, a great many of our members you know, see the value that is placed in culture and just wish that similar values was placed on their involvement in culture and what they get out of culture in, in Scotland because they feel somewhat disconnected from those metrics. It always seems to be about, you know, what does society get out of that? What, do, you know, what, what if impact does culture have in the economy and, and the well-being of the Scottish people when they feel that they are not part of that equation, and I think this is where, uh, you know, ironically, the vast majority of them certainly again in, in live, in the live arts are in it because they love it, not because they want to make a living out of it because that's impossible. Uh, so they've always felt that you know that the emphasis uh, hasn't been sufficiently weighted towards the experience of working in, in culture from from their point of view. So this is where we you know. But all the, the entertainment unions have put so much emphasis on, you know, the fair work principles, the, the agencies like Creative Scotland, Screen Scotland, Event Scotland, they need to champion the people working in the industry much more significantly than they have done. And, you know, and, and to be honest, the, you know, the past year or so, as I've said before, a lot of people have felt abandoned by these agencies rather than supported by them. I, uh, so the... the you know, the, the metrics are, are there, they're, they're a good barometer of where we want to try and get to, but the emphasis needs to, more emphasis needs to be put on taking the workers in the industry with us on this journey. Mr Dolman? Yeah, I mean, I think the metrics are okay as far as they go, as as long as we understand that, that A, we're only measuring certain things and there's there's many more things that you could choose to measure. Um, and and B, that, that they're not really giving us a, a, a full picture of, of what's going on and C, that these things are notoriously difficult to get accurate numbers on anyway. So when we talk about the number of people working in, say, the music sector, how do we define work? There's a big difference between somebody who's, who's you know, first violin with the RSNO and somebody who's got a nine-to-five job and is also gigging in a band in local pubs at the weekend for, for fun and a bit of beer money. 
that you know those two people are both technically working in the music industry but they've got very different uh very very different uh uh roles and and are coming from different places in terms of you know attendance of cultural events again what are we what are we talking about if you're just looking at numbers of people that went to to an, an event i mean you can skew those figures massively based on whether you include edinburgh festival or not for example so it's not just about kind of numbers of people going to things. It's about just understanding that the the numbers themselves can't be the only indicator. And I think that one of the one of the other key things for me that, that's not really covered about that is is to do with kind of education in the in the cultural um, sector and the creative arts particularly. Very welcome that the 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 recent commitments about removing instrumental tuition fees for all children in in Scotland. That's great. It's something that, that we're really pleased to see. But it's also, there's a, there's a much bigger uh, conversation to be had about the value of culture and the way that we perceive culture, both as a, um, as a subject in education and also in the role it plays in, in our society. For too long now, the creative arts particularly are, are somewhere down the bottom of hierarchy of subjects, where we have kind of English and maths and sciences at the top. And then the creative arts are seen as, as almost like a, a hobby, a nice to have, but not really that important. If we want a thriving cultural sector, then we have to inculcate the notion that creative arts are valuable and essential to society and are just as important as the other, the other subjects. Um, and similarly, in terms of the way that we view the cultural industries and the people that, that work in it, too many, the perception too often is that the, that the creative industries are are, are not real jobs they're they're hobbyists or you know it's something that should be done for fun and if it's hard to make a living then you should go and and work in another industry you know where you can we saw that in the in the pandemic with those reprehensible uh, adverts from from the westminster government about you know your next job should be in cyber go and retrain because you can't you know you can't continue as a musician or as a ballet dancer or whatever it happens to be and that attitude that, that, that culture is an add-on, is an optional thing, rather than a totally integrated, thriving, vital part of the human experience and our everyday lives, until we change that perception, I think we're always, we're always going to be, be struggling a little bit. And for me, those softer, perhaps harder to measure intangibles are still worth striving for and are probably um, a better indicator of the, the success of of culture and creative industries in Scotland, rather than just looking at spreadsheets of numbers of, of people attended and you know access to to events. Mm -hmm. If um, I can make a, a point very briefly, which I made wanted to make before about about access to events as well, one of the things in the the written submission that I wanted to to stress again was um, uncertainty around events in the years going forward. At the moment, particularly with the rising case numbers in in Scotland, with the discussion around um, vaccination certification and the real fear that restrictions could come back. It's a very, very uncertain, nervous time for event organisers, festival, festivals, um, management of, of orchestras and all the rest of it. And I think one thing that it's really important for me to say today is that, although it's not really the, the main remit of the committee, but to be on the record as saying a reintroduction of restrictions and social distancing measures will be absolutely disastrous for the cultural and creative industries and events just and and uh, and and gigs just will not be able to happen because they're not financially viable. The fear of those and the fear of the return at the moment is making it really difficult. And there will be events that, on the assumption that we don't have a reintrodu reintroduction of restrictions, will not go ahead because of the worry of that possibility. And that's a shame. So I think that the government needs to recognise that and and start to take some measures both to, to ensure that uh, there will be financial support if events have to be cancelled, but also to try and give some confidence to the industry to ensure that in that short to medium term, people can plan to host events and they can make commitments, engage artists and all the rest of it, um, which they're very, very twitchy about doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. okay. um, does Mr McManus want to come back in finally? Uh, yes, I think it, it kind of shows the different perceptions you've got across the, uh, across the sector. As uh, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, following the first minister's statement last week, a great many of our members were saying, "Right, well, why aren't we protected by these measures?" 
So, you know, it, it, I think it varies dramatically whether you're face to face with the audience. I made, you know, I made the point at a meeting the other day that, you know, th there are different aspects of different challenges that need to be thought through. People need to understand the realities of this. The, you know, the football clubs have, have an issue and a challenge with getting 10,000 people into a stadium and, and uh, checking their COVID vaccinated. However, the staff working in the outside broadcast to film that football match have all been tested and all have to prove negative, but then have to work their way and intermingle with audiences. Uh, and they have, got, again, fearful for their safety that they've got no idea who they're intermingling with. So, you know, logistically, it is a, is a big challenge. Public health has to come first. And as Barry says, there has to be a realisation that every decision the government makes in terms of, you know, addressing COVID going forward, it needs to be there ready to support and it needs to have robust measures in, in place. Uh, yeah. One other consequence, one final point I would make is that through COVID, we have seen a number of commercial operators putting, submitting inquiries into some of the Scottish theatres to see if they'd be willing to, to sell out to the big commercial operators. Uh, yeah. And the commercial operators, as I say, generally through COVID across the UK, their approach has been to try and reduce staffing costs, reduce terms and conditions, and go in an opposite direction from what I believe we're trying to achieve in, in Scotland. So, again, if some of these uh, organisations uh, aren't supported to, to rebuild in the right way, we could end up with commercial operators coming in and taking us in, in the opposite direction. You know. Uh, we've had discussions with, with some of them and, and the Ambassador Theatre Group, for instance, who run the Playhouse in Edinburgh. You know, I think it's safe to say they're horrified by the prospect of fair work principles coming in. And, you know, at a time when we're trying to take the cultural industries, live events, theatre, film and TV, to, to new levels of, you know, improving the life of the people who work in there, many of our members... In, in the live events in theatre, they don't want, you know, the, we had the other discussion about the BBC. People people liken them to the big commercial operators in, in the theatre world. You know, the commissioning tariffs since the introduction of the BBC Scotland Channel has essentially been a race to the bottom. You know, we've seen more and more of BBC Scotland sliced off power sent away to London in terms of the staffing, the production, the commissioning, rates are being driven down and people see if more commercial operators are allowed to come into the theatre world in Scotland and operate in the same way as the BBC, then effectively they see us going in diametrically opposite direction to what we would prefer to do in terms of investing in the staff and the workforce in Scotland. Thank you. Mr Ruskell, do you have a small supplementary? Um, just, just a very quick one. I mean, clearly the cultural sector is hugely important in its own right. Cultural activity really important in its own right as well. I suppose in, in terms of what it does for the rest of society as well, whether that's being captured by funding streams at the moment. Um, you know, I'm struck by some cultural organisations that are a lot, doing a lot of regeneration work, uh, a lot of placemaking work, whether they can get access to funding at the moment to do that kind of stuff that doesn't easily fit into one box or another. Mr. Dolman first and then Mr. McManus. Thanks. If you could be try and keep your answers short, that would be really helpful at this time. Thanks. It's a, it's, it's a little bit difficult for, for me to say purely from a music point of view, just on the, on the, the basis that with so many freelance members, it's, you know, working in such a variety of different situations. You know, we, we represent the individual musician, not the organizations. Um, what I, what I can tell you is that most of, of the, the orchestras, um, are in doing increasing amounts of, of outreach work with, a, with more emphasis on, on education and kind of broader cultural engagement than they might have done previously where, you know, in years gone by, they would have just run a concert series in a, in a, in a hall. Um, I think these things are tremendously important and culture, not just in terms of, of the economy, but as I mentioned before, the fabric of our society, it's the thing that everybody turned to during the pandemic. What did everyone do? They started watching Netflix and listening to music and consuming, you know, culture produced by the creative and cultural industries. Um, 
And it's a, it's the heartbeat of our society, really. And yes, there's a big role for cultural to play in linking up with people, in regeneration, in bringing communities together, in reaching out to rural communities and providing access to opportunities, giving, inspiring people, showcasing um, a different range of possibilities for, for than you might ever have received from the day-to-day -day society around you. So this is part of the reason why I'm so passionate about our industries and why I think they're so important. And it goes way beyond the economic impact because it's, it's to do with who we are and, and how we live our lives. And again, these things, as I mentioned before, are hard to measure on a spreadsheet, but they are crucial. And this is part of a much bigger conversation about the society and the country that we want to live in and what we want life to be like in terms of quality of life, not just how much money you make or your financial security. Thank you. Mr. McManus, very briefly, please. I, I think what I would, I would like to see is an ever increasing more strategic approach uh, to all these sorts of initiatives. Too often, as I said earlier on, we're just trying to get, give whatever money we've got to as many people as possible who seem to be trying to do, do the right thing. And I think at some level, we need to sit down and make a conscious decision and say, right, that let's try and pull all these different strands together, the local authorities, the national agencies. We need to come up with a clear strategy over the next five to ten years and then fund it as best we can. We are, you know, there's, there's always budget pressures, but decide this is the proper level of funding that these organisations need to deliver our priorities and we can't go on just trying to chuck money at, at everybody. And, and with, you know, when I say more strategic, I'm thinking of things like we recognise that you know the cultural industries are essential for people's well-being, and the more people engage in the cultural industries and sport, the less money will be spent on treatment in hospitals and, and all the rest of it. But are we going to get any of the hospitals or the National Health Service to put money into culture because they've got their own bills to pay? Yeah. Somebody needs to make a decision there and say. You know, we can save X amount in, in hospital bills if we put more into culture. And that, that's what I mean by kind of more holistic and strategic approach across the, across the piece. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, and I think your, your final comment kind of winds up uh, in, in some of the areas that perhaps we haven't been able to touch on today and about how the culture um, community is going to be absolutely essential to the wellbeing economy agenda. Um, uh, although we are very focused on, on the, the funding for the cultural sector for this inquiry, we have already seen how many areas this takes up, in, including the Fair Work Agenda. Um, we did not talk about the climate, we did not talk about um, you know, net zero targets and how that will affect touring companies and maybe the, you know, the, the, the industry going forward, but there is a lot there to discuss. And, and, um, obviously, we'll there's a pre-budget scrutiny and the budget will be published, but um, in the programme for government, as mentioned, there's been the announcement of the Turing Fund. And also, um, interestingly, because it did come up, um, the government have said that they, they are committed to providing regular funding by agreeing three-year funding settlements. So I'm sure the committee will be interested in seeing what the detail of that is going forward from the evidence today. So thank you, Mr McManus uh, uh, and Mr Dolman, very much for your attendance this morning. I'm going to suspend committee now till we complete our final agenda item.